Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 8th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. Well, you know what's coming here. You know I say this every week, but this week, I think you'll see that I really mean it. We've got a lot to cover, especially when we get to the uh, charts in the market, so uh, let me go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew, which I guess is still PepsiCo. Did not compensate me for this free endorsement, but hey, if you're out there watching the show, give me a shout out. Oh, good stuff. All right, get a little jacked up on the deuce so we can cover everything. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up real quick. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. A lot of stuff's been happening lately. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, this is the part of the show where I beg for a review. Sometimes we have more people here than there are reviews on Amazon. So somebody's holding out on me. So if you don't mind, put up a review on that. I actively solicit reviews for my book. Uh, and the uh, reason is sometimes you get people who review the reviewers instead of say, say, saying anything about the book, which uh, makes no sense to me. Anyway, if you get a chance... Uh, no, don't, if you get a chance, make a chance. Make time. I remember review on Amazon. I appreciate it. All right. All right, what did we talk about? Well, last week, um, I got a little confused, and I'll tell you why in a second. I thought the question was, should we switch to a choppy market message in a, uh, a method? And the question is, should we shorten our time frames? Well, that'll make a lot more sense. Um, I have some thoughts in general, and mostly um, a lot of today's show is just a lot of thoughts about what happens when a market makes a transition, how to make that transition. We'll be talking about this quite a lot, and I think there's a, it, it's not unfolding in, in a, what I would call a perfect or a beautiful manner. And that's okay, and that's markets, and markets are, will do what they often have to do to frustrate the most, and the corollary to that, and these are, I, I borrowed these from Linda Rask, and she said she's got them off the floor back in the day. The corollary to that is that uh, markets, will do, markets will do what they have to do to cause the most pain to most people, and markets will often do the most obvious and most unobvious manner, meaning that, if they're heading lower, like something like the Russell or even the NASDAQ, and it looks like they're obviously headed lower, they're going to have a lot of fits and starts along the way. It's going to be choppy. It's not going to be a straight route lower. Um, I want to talk about portfolio ebb and flow because that's very current to what's going on now. We had a fairly sizable number of positions in the portfolio, and then they started coming out one by one and then uh, two by two yesterday. So there's only one stock left in the portfolio. I don't want to look at the last little run we had and um, talk about living through flat times and et cetera. And that all makes sense in one second. Now, last week I was talking, this is kind of actually turning my stomach. It's even hard for me to look at. But, uh, I, you know, I did some Googling on These are Mopane worms. And last, uh, you went, it was like, why is he showing me a Mopane worm? Well, uh, last week I was talking with Peter via Skype, and back when he was in South Africa, he was telling me about uh, the house um, help would uh, bring these worms in the house and, and uh, gut them and cook them. And the way you gut them is you squeeze them and then you, know, you pinch the tail off and then you squeeze it like a tube of toothpaste, uh, according to wikipedia.com. Anyway, this is actually uh, his house and actually a worm that was in his house. Um, they're moth uh, caterpillars is what they are, a big, uh, about fairly sizable moth, about a five-inch moth from what it says on the Internet. Anywho, um, so we were talking about Mopane worms, and then Peter asked a question, a market question, so it kind of threw me for a loop. And what I thought Peter was asking, and I didn't read the question carefully until I did my presentation last week, and I thought what Peter was asking was this. Um, if you're trading a trending system and the market begins to become choppy, then should you switch to a choppy market system? And that's not what he's asking. And I spent a lot of time talking about this last week, and we'll spend a little time in just a minute on this. But the, the answer to this question is no, because by the time you identify the choppy conditions, the market begins to trend again. 
And then there's also some problems with uh, trading overbought and oversold. And in an ideal world, uh, overbought and oversold would look like a sine wave. In reality, markets stop well short of oversold, and then they take off. And then uh, sometimes they stay overbought for a long time, and then sometimes they overshoot all the way, way to the downside. And it could be a very dangerous and, and tough way to trade. So I don't suggest you change methodologies. Now, to answer Peter's question, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, nice thoughts about cooking worms. So much for deciding about whether I'm having lunch today. <laughs> well, you know, Peter says, because I, I said, uh, Peter, I love to taste them. And he said, uh, he says, don't bother. They taste like old, burnt, uh, chewy rubber and that's been boiled. But on um, Wikipedia, it says they taste like honey roasted barbecue. So I, I, I think I would, I would taste them. Uh, I'm a coon ass. I'll eat anything, um, sometimes twice. So I'll try it. I mean, you know, the, can you imagine how hungry the guy was that ate the first crawfish? <laughs> um, we walk out to our front yard, stomp, and say gumbo. So I'll try one. Uh, I'm not scared, but I'd prefer the one that tastes a little bit more like honey roasted uh, barbecue. Uh, and according to Wikipedia, you know, take that that and uh, that and five bucks might get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Maybe um, said that they asked the tribesman what he thought about the uh, honey roasted barbecue, and he said, "Oh, it tastes like moping worm." So whatever. Um, so should you shorten your time frame with choppy markets? And I just want to have uh, just give some, give you some thoughts on this. Uh, one thing that that kind of strikes jumps out at me. Years ago, I was doing some S and P futures day trading and that's when it was a big contract and there weren't there weren't any minis or anything like that and then um, I learned fairly quickly that even if you are trading something intraday where you need to catch that trend day you're going to get more trend days when the market itself is a choppy so if the market let's say you're trading a market that looks like this and you're trading it today, there's a better chance of you getting in on that trend day where the market generally trends throughout the day, and that's where you make your money. But if the market is chopping around, you tend to get some little narrow range bar days, and then you catch some trend days here or there, but a lot of times you end up chasing your own tail. So even though the market becomes choppy, if you shorten your time frame, uh, it could become somewhat dangerous because you're going to have a harder time catching those uh, trends. Okay. Uh, if you do decide to trade like that, you probably would be better off, let's say it's a choppy market, you'd probably be better off trading at the fringes of that choppy market, meaning that wait till that market is making a new significant high or a new significant low and or is overbought or oversold. And it looks to trade some sort of reversal, maybe like a bow tie or something. And the reason the, the short your time frame, patterns are fractal. So it works in daily charts, also works intraday and, and what works in daily charts also works in weekly and monthly charts okay so that's about that's the point and that's what Peter's point is because they have fractals should we just drop down uh, maybe a level the problem in doing that or another issue that you're going to have to deal with is that each tick could come become bigger than it really is if you start watching the market too closely um, it's not only bad for you physically, obviously, to strain your eyes and and then you, all the other problems that come along with being in front of a desk all day. Um, but each tick can become really, really bigger than it really is. And you, you look at the little uptick and you think, oh, my goodness, it's going straight up. And then you look at a down tick or two and, oh, it's going straight down. And before you know it, you really can end up chasing your own tail. And as I often preach, uh, it, you end up making a lot of decisions sometimes. If you're watching, if you're not careful, and you're getting sucked into day trading, the siren call of day trading, and with those decisions comes emotions, or with those emotions come decisions, and vice versa. Um, and if, I think we're only wired to make so many decisions. And I've known quite a few day traders who have gone crazy, and who have um, some of them have uh, fallen off the face of the earth. And I wonder what happened to those guys. So. It, it can make you nuts, and if you don't believe me, day trade for a while, and 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 um, and you'll see. And uh, I've talked with, I'll be talking with somebody, and and we'll be talking whatever, and all of a sudden they're like, ah! And I'm like, what happens? Your house on fire? No, oh, the position's going against me. It's like, geez, 
you can't live like that every day, all day long. Some can, but most can't. But you certainly don't want to be that emotional about it. Um, you will have some emotions in trading. That's just a fact of life. Um, just because you decide to trade doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. And it doesn't mean that you will drop some F-bombs on occasion. Um, I dropped a few yesterday. Uh, one thing to remember, even if you do shorten your time horizon, and let's say you're even trading intraday, just remember that something bad can always happen. You could actually be long or short a stock intraday, and they could halt an intraday and then come back, and then your next uh, trades could be significantly different. It could be a very adverse move. And the problem in general with very short-term trading, even swing trading for that matter, and this is why we try to keep an open-ended aspect or we're looking for that open-ended aspect where you have unlimited profitability. But if you just trade short-term, your profitability is going to general, generally be, be limited and you don't really have that unlimited aspect. Unfortunately, uh, that doesn't mean that something bad can't still happen to you. Okay, And if you are day trading, you're going to have to have uh, a bigger size to make it all worthwhile. Now, one thing that some people will say, and like right now, the energies, we'll take a look at them in just a minute. The energies are just doing this. They're just going up, going up, going up, going up. And they're not really pulling back, letting us in. Okay, there's an issue or two we might be looking at that, that have already pulled back. For the most part, it's been a hard market to get on board. Well, whenever market starts doing this, usually I get emails. Not so much this time because it's just one sector. But it, when the overall market's doing that and doesn't want to pull back, I'll get emails from people either telling me what they're going to do or telling me they started doing it and how much money they're making or they're they're on the cusp of. Um, going to 60 minute they're looking they're going to look at this chart and say oh the daily's up so i'm going to look at i'm going to watch that 60 minute chart and if when it begins to correct i'm going to get in the problem with that is you're still buying into this over overbought market even though you're doing it intraday and you think you're being smart and cute and i hear you but it seems like as soon as you get around to doing that that market's going to have a major major correction and when it does it's going to take you out, and then this size of the position will have to be substantial to make it worthwhile. And if it corrects on you, then it's going to be, uh, it's going to cause a lot of pain. So, I think trying to get into longer-term trends intraday. I think on paper it sounds fantastic. Um, what's the old saying? In theory, practice and theory are the same. In practice, they are not. So it's going to. It sounds great. It seems great again until that bigger picture correction uh, wax you. So what I'm going to what I'm saying here is don't trade stock don't change styles which I'll have a little bit more to say about in um, a minute and then um, I'm sorry I'm, re I'm trying to multi-process which has been proven that you cannot do um, don't change styles and don't change methods. Hello Dave haven't, haven't you ever met a crazy trader who was not a day trader? Ah, uh, well, by crazy, I meant has gone crazy, and I'm assuming they have gone crazy through day trading. Yeah, I've met a lot of crazy people. <laughs> so, okay. All right, good questions. Keep them coming. I'll, I'll get to them as I can relate them to the uh, slides. Okay. Um. And then I quoted Greg last week, and I'll show you his quote from last week uh, as it kind of dovetails in or it's still relevant to what we're doing. So I left it in the slides. Uh, but this morning I'm, I'm um, working on finishing up his book, and it's a pretty good book. It's comprehensive. Um, some of the indicator stuff I'm not really into, but some of the indicator stuff does make some sense to me, especially if you're not purely using an oscillator or something, if you're using like one market versus another one on like a pair type of situation, I find that stuff kind of interesting and it's something that I'll probably research a little further. Um, but anyway, it's a good book. Uh, it, the, the first half of it, he pretty much rips a new one uh, for academia. 
uh, or at least the modern portfolio theory or whatever that is, the modern th finance and how it's wrong. And then he also rips to, rips to shreds uh, the um, conventional wisdom on Wall Street. I did it in kind of a matter-of-fact uh, opinion way, and he did it in a little bit more statistical way, which, which, is, um, which is good. He wanted it to be more of statistics than opinion. But um, anyway, we both came to the same conclusion, at least in the first half of our books, that um, the market doesn't always go up longer term and that you need to be a trader. Uh, before I digress too far, what I read this morning is the absolute worst time to create a change of rule is when you're emotionally concerned about something that just seems not to be working correctly. And right now, we've entered into this choppy period, which I'll show you in just one second. And right now, some of the, the trend following stuff obviously isn't working out so great. So right now, you think, well, maybe I should change styles or put some new rules in or whatever. And the way I feel about that is um, I, I, I could ask Nicholas, and Nicholas would say, no, it's a Nicholas fine. You don't really want to change styles or methods. Uh, just because the market changes a little bit. And I think that's what he was alluding to last week. And this is when you get a, a trending market that goes into a choppy market. And then the obvious question becomes, why not use adaptive measures to help you identify the two types of markets? And the problem is the lag, is, as I often say, is the lag between the two types of markets and the fact that there is no clear period of delineation is the issue. And one thing that I... I kind of been thinking about lately is you sort of you sort of end up fighting the last battle it's kind of like ah it's choppy I'm gonna put this choppy market system into place and by the time you get it into place the market begins trending again and then when you recognize the market is trending then you uh, switch back over to the trending methodology and of course that's when the chop begins to start again the thing to remember is no matter what type of um, system you are trading in order to profit you have to capture a trend in a market and people will go on and on about I'm a contra trend trader and it's like okay well that's fine but once you get into that market you better capture a trend so my feeling is why not be a trend trader all of the time and then I don't want to get into too too much today as I alluded to earlier the choppy market systems have their inherent problems. A choppy market system will tell you that if a market is overbought, I'm sorry, let's just say if, if it's oversold, uh, it says if it's oversold, then you should buy it, okay? Well, so that means if you buy it here, well, what if it goes to here so it's even more oversold? So, yeah, you should buy more if it does that, or you should just not use a stop. Well, eventually you're going to blow up by doing that so it's a great way to have a very brief uh, brilliant but brief career on Wall Street okay uh, Greg goes on to say it's natural instinct and it is natural instinct to want it's just there's a lot of things that we do that are human nature and the trading world and they just flat out don't work simply because they are human nature the beauty of it is because most other people are following human nature we, longer term, not every day, and not every week, and not every month, and sometimes not every year, but longer term, we as trend followers will use human nature, uh, others' emotions, and the human nature of others through reading of the charts to prosper. So he says it's a natural instinct to want to change strategy in order to respond more quickly from one to the other. Natural instincts are what we are trying to avoid simply because they're generally wrong and painfully were wrong at the worst time. Uh, Sharpshooting the process is the beginning of the end. I like the way, Greg, we, we, would, we were having a beer um, a few weeks ago. He passed through town, and we were having a beer together. And um, I was talking about, like, on a service, if, if I have a really good run, I'll still lose clients sometimes because what will happen is they'll take, two or three losing trades and then they won't take the seven or eight winning trades or sometimes it'll sometimes the numbers aren't nearly that well it'll be one huge winner and two or three big losses and they'll end up with the I'm sorry not big losses small losses they'll end up with the small losses and not the the, the, 
the big um, winner. And then that's what Greg was pointing out. He said that he called that sharpshooting. That's the first time I heard it. And then a week later, I read his book, Sharpshooting the Process is the Beginning and the End. So he's talking about sharpshooting the the trend process, the trend following process, and trying to trying to change your hat to a choppy market mode and then trying to get into a trend market mode, etc. cetera. Um, I haven't seen it done. Nobody's been proved, nobody's proved to me that it can be done. And I think you're going to end up chasing your own tail if you try to do it. Everything I've found is that you find a methodology and you stick with it, good, bad, or indifferent, and then um, provide it as a longer-term viable methodology. So if you want to change styles or time frames, I think it's a really bad idea. Now, the waiting can be the hardest part. Tom Petty got it right. And the problem is there are no so-called income-producing strategies. The market is really not going to give you a paycheck. If you are going to trend follow, then there's going to be some really good times where you print money, then there's going to be some mediocre times, and there's going to be some less than mediocre times, or even worse. Um, but it goes against human nature to wait it out. And I think as humans, as successful humans, as motivated humans, okay, and everyone here is motivated because why would you be taking your time out of your busy schedules to to listen to me talk about the markets, okay? So you're motivated. You want to get even more educated. You want to learn more about the markets. You want to see what I have to say about them, good, bad, or indifferent. So you're obviously a motivated individual. You're taking action. You're actually doing something. So it goes against, I should say, motivated human nature to end up in a situation where you're not doing anything or shouldn't be doing anything. But what you need to do is I am i can't sit still for long, okay? I was overserved one night, and the next day I was kind of um, – I was laying on the couch uh, for about 10 minutes, and then uh, my daughter pointed out, wow, I've never seen that before. And it's like I immediately got up. I just couldn't – I couldn't even lay there anymore. I just had to get up and do something. I can't sit still. It drives my wife nuts, uh, short trip. But, uh, like, because when I'm sitting down, my leg's shaking and I'm always constantly moving. So I have this energy that I have to focus. And if I focus it into trading the markets, I'm just going to dig myself a deeper hole when conditions aren't, aren't um, not viable, but uh, friendly to my methodology, okay? So during those times, you want to do your homework, and you do want to do a little research, and lately I've been doing a lot of research in, in IPOs, and uh, you'll probably hear quite a bit more about that really soon. But you want to do you, you want to do your homework, meaning you want to keep looking at all those stocks every day, and you want to look at all those sectors every day, and you want to continue to be that little detective. You want to continue to be on that treasure hunt. And sometimes it's hard. I mean, there are days where I get excited and I'm looking through charts that I can't decide. There's so many good charts, and I have a hard time deciding on which ones, and I just get really excited. There are other days where I almost fall asleep uh, going through these charts because there's really nothing to do. And lately, it's been a little bit more of uh, the latter. Um, so, and the other thing, too, would be keep yourself busy. Uh, I'm writing a series of articles for a European publication, Traders Magazine, right now. Um, I'm thinking about my next projects uh, on my educational business. I'm thinking a lot about IPOs. I'm doing a lot of research on IPOs. I have a lot going on. I wish I could clone myself uh, because there's so much going on, but most of what I'm doing right now is not trading. And you're like, well, why? Well, the S&P has gone sideways for two months. The NASDAQ has gone sideways for one month. The Russell's in a nice downtrend, but it's a really choppy downtrend. So there's just not a whole lot of set up and not a whole lot to do at this juncture. And I'll make I'll show you some charts on that in just one second. Um, and this is a, this is a little counterintuitive, but it makes so much sense. And it's funny, the longer you're in this business, it never gets easy, but it does get easier, and you do get a little bit more philosophical. And one thing that that I know is the reason that trend following works is because sometimes it don't, okay? And that makes a lot of sense. And I could just see, I could see the people kind of come through the revolving door 
trying to change hats and trying to switch styles, etc. And I've got a chart I'll show you in one second. But people get all excited about trend following when it's working. And then when it stops working, they throw in the towel and they give up. Well, if you know the nuances of your methodology, and this is a big part of psychology. I divided it into the three M's, which is mind, your methodology, and the money management. Okay, money, mind, got my mind and my money and my money and my mind and your method. Okay, <clears throat> if you know your methodology, and this is vitally important, it doesn't, it's not my way or highway. Okay, if you got a, your own way of doing it, then fine, that's great. And you know your methodology, then when the bad times come along or the less than ideal times come along, you recognize them because you've lived through a few cycles, as I have written down here, okay? But you've also studied enough cycles to know that, hey, it doesn't always print money. So you know that there's going to be some down times where you might have to focus your energies on your research or pay attention to some loved ones in your family or whatever, as opposed to digging yourself into a deeper hole. Okay, But you need to know the nuances of the methodology. And I tell people coming in, coming into the service, hey, glad to have you, obviously. And I tell them, it might take a little while. Sometimes it takes six to eight months and occasionally longer to capture a good momentum cycle. But can't guarantee the future, Rob, but so far, for the last 20 years, there's been cycles that come along, and sometimes they're a little too and few and far between, you might feel. But then there's always been some good cycles that come along and make it all worthwhile and living through enough of these less than ideal conditions really helps you to get through it and this is just one of my favorite uh, charts that I put together here and this actually happened um, on this exact day this is where I got an email from a client bravo for your system well look at the market just nice persistent uptrend had a little bit of a correction here it didn't come unglued but then it went back to a nice persistent uptrend now I'm not sure exactly when he started but it was somewhere in one of these legs higher and he did extremely well. Um, I had some other clients. I don't know if it was the same exact time, but it was another period of time. This happens. This has happened so many times. There's so many different clients. But uh, I've had clients um, uh, send me gifts. You know, <laughs> uh, not money or anything. Not anything taxed. To tax. I'd have to claim on my taxes. But like the little tokens of appreciation because it's like, wow. It, until I found you, I've been searching and searching and searching, and now I see the light. Well, a couple of months later, you end up in a market that looks like this, okay? Comes time to renew, and now they're off doing something else by then. And then what happens, what happens, of course, we get a nice trend higher once again, okay? So I think the secret to any methodology is we're all, we're all gung-ho. We're all excited. It's a bunch of fun to trade a methodology when it's working. It's when it's not that makes life hard, and that's when you have to be careful and not to try to, like my buddy Peter Marthy says, invent trades. Okay, you just have to let the market come to you. Uh, getting back to the ebb and flow, the portfolio that we talk about so much, it's like we had a pretty full portfolio. If you go back and watch webinars from earlier this year's year, and then you'll notice that we've kind of gotten taken out one by one, and sometimes like a day like yesterday, two by two on positions. Uh, the Mike Tyson quote kind of comes to mind because um, I did get some phone calls yesterday. Hey, Dave, what do we do? And it's like, well, looks like we're getting stopped out. It's, it, it, it is what it is. So you have to follow that plan. And everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's when it... Um, becomes a little tougher to follow your plan. Now you have to honor your stops and I put beyond any discretionary calls. Okay. Sometimes discretionary calls can be tough. A lot of times though, quite often, 
they're pretty easy. Uh, you're in a market, you got to stop right here. You come in the day before, the market's about right there. So you know on the next open, that stop will probably get hit. So if the market opens down here and then turns right back around, you stay with that position. The only risk of micro amount of what you should have. Now, if you're in a market and it does this, intraday and it's doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, you need to have an uncle point in mind at some point and not risk too much. And the old cliche, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, comes to mind. Uh, by honoring your stops, um, I still drop an F-bomb, so I don't talk out of both sides of my mouth. But I also see it as a cleansing process. In some cases, I'm just glad to get these stinkers out of the portfolio. And even well, some of them that, that are profitable and stopping out at a profitable profitable um, level. I'm okay with that too because that's the market telling me that my stock has ran its course and because of a fairly liberal longer term trend following stop on that position I get taken out at a level where it's probably not going to resume that trend and it's better than the poke in the eye on the trade. Okay. Uh, being flat is okay. Again, there's no there's no uh, magical income producing strategies. You're not going to make much being flat. But as I've been saying quite often in the column lately, return of capital, and this is the kind of market we're in, return of capital is much more important than return on capital at this point in time. Now, I just want to show you real quick. We had a pretty good run. As of late, now this is the mechanical portfolio. I don't want to show you one or two things in here where some discretion would have paid off. One, one in particular, and then just a couple other things. Um, the and what's kind of interesting, I and mean, this is not to. Um, the point is, when when times are good, all, everything works. And even these losing positions in here, these ones that were losses, at one time they were they were. They were profitable. Unfortunately, they weren't profitable enough, with the exception of this one here, to um, to take those profits. But uh, before I digress too far, you had 8 out of 11 winning trades, which is a really good run. Now, I would actually prefer to see more small reds in here and more bigger blacks, so the bottom line was much bigger on the last run. So this was one of those runs where... You just made a bunch of short-term profits, but nothing really materialized longer term. And you can see that the, the, the trending loaf in this particular trade made the same amount as a trading loaf, and that's one of the better positions in here. But it's still not a bad run nonetheless. If you could do this well all the time, you would own the world pretty quickly. And the other thing is that with a little discretion, for instance, just this one position here, which was in a few within a few cents of the profit target, as I showed last week, would have made a big swing difference in the portfolio. So this would have actually have been a profitable trade, not by much, but profitable overall with a tiny bit of discretion. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you let the ebb and flow uh, work its way through the portfolio. You allow yourself to be stopped out. Let the market take you out of those positions. See it as a cleansing process. And now we're down to one position. Okay, If it works, fine. If we get knocked out of it, so what? We're ready to fight another day. We're ready to put some new positions in. But we're going to be very selective until market conditions overall improve. Got a lot of good questions coming in. So let me see what I can uh, do here. Cash is a position. That's a good way of putting it. Craig says, no worries, Dave. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. Craig and I were talking yesterday. Craig's a dog trainer. He was equating dog training to markets, and um, I think he's right. Okay, James says, uh, have you discovered if there is an ideal maximum minimum number of stocks for your trend following methodology. If so, does it change the bull and bear sideways markets? How would you how would the max and minimum drawdowns be? Perhaps these questions about finding an ideal sample size. Thanks. Um, there's no okay, it's a skewed methodology. 
And it's also, and Peter Mothy told me to stop using this term because um, he, he, he um, when he invited me to speak at the Dallas Technical Analysis um, after meeting, um, he criticized me for using this term. But for lack of a better term, it can be streaky uh, where it comes in streaks, okay? Momentum, and that's one thing I haven't solved for with momentum and, and probably never will. So you're going to have a bunch of setups at one time and then not a whole lot at another. And then what really makes it work, the, what I just showed you is not where it really works, although I'm not complaining. This is a pretty good run, okay? To get 8 out of 11 positions profitable like this, that's a pretty good run. But the real money is in that occasional solar stock, such as like the SPWR, where you make $25,000 on one position, on, or 20, if you want to look at it, 25%, as opposed to 7 to 9% over uh, quite a few positions in here, okay? So that's where the real money is in the occasional outliers. So it's difficult to quantify anything on a methodology that depends on outliers. Um, earlier I said there's no... Um, it, it, or I guess on the flip side, people can quantify a short-term system. Let's say they're, they're doing... Um, some sort of option selling or something, which is a bad idea in and of itself. But let's say they're doing some sort of option selling, and they can quantify that they're going to make uh, so much per trade and over a period of time, and they can quantify all these little numbers and show you this big sample. But what they can't do is they can't show you the one or two trades every few months that would wipe out three, six, maybe a year or two, or maybe their entire account worth of trading when an outlier does hit. So predicting the outlier is tough, but we're actually playing the outlier. A CTA friend of mine back from my CTA days many years ago, uh, early in my career. In fact, he actually helped launch my career by um, hooking me up with some old school guys and, and and such. But anyway, he pointed out that we're playing. We're actually playing for that outlier, and that's we're looking for that that uh, black swan type of move, uh, which is named Talib talks about. Uh, that's all he talks about. But uh, so it's hard to quantify that black swan, that big outlier, because I don't know when that big position is going to come along. I mean, I thought some of these gold stocks would work out. We had two stopped out of profits this year, but neither one of them materialized into anything significant. So I can't quantify that. In fact, as you've heard me talk possibly before, if you could quantify something in the market to an absolute edge, you would own the world. But markets are not normally distributed. In other words, they don't adhere strictly to statistics. And if you take a look at the casino industry, it's a trillion dollar or trillions of dollars of industry. And a lot of times their edge is very small, half percent, maybe a percent. I know there's some games where it's, you know, sucker bets. But for the most part, their edge is very, very tiny, yet the business makes trillions of dollars. So if there was a way you had an edge in the market and you could guarantee that edge, then you should put, you would have to sell all your worth, your worldly possessions and put all your money in that because you'd have so much more money coming down the market, but you don't. So it's very difficult to quantify. Uh, there's some things I, I like to do. I like to keep drawdowns as, as, small as possible and ideally you want to you don't want to go much more below uh, 20 percent in fact 20 percent is really huge so by by placing and I hate to use the word bets but by placing fairly reasonably sized bets and trading when when the conditions are in your favor um, and then allowing the markets to stop you out when they're not you can mitigate those drawdowns by becoming flat at times like now. So we got one position on. So what? Market goes through the roof. So what? Market drops like a stone. So what? It's just one position. So the number of positions is all is going to be dictated by market conditions. You're going to get more and more positions in good conditions. Now, let's say I have four or five open positions and they're just kind of marginally profitable. And this is where discretion comes in. I tell myself, well, 
let's take a look at this sixth position. Should I take it or should I not? Do I really, really like the setup? Well, if I really, really like it, then by all means, I'll take it. But I need to strongly consider going into that sixth position if my other five positions really aren't working that great, okay? Maybe I got fooled into those five positions, but it's like after about five positions or even three or four, you really need to think hard before you put on that next position or next position. Now, if you got one of those five positions that's closer to the profit target, one of them is profitable, another one's looking pretty good, uh, one of them's maybe breaking even, and you know you're going to start taking money off the table soon as they begin hitting profit targets, then by all means, start putting on new positions. So my point is that it will, you have to self-regulate the process. Right now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of stocks that are setting up, so I'm not adding any new positions in uh, to speak of. I mean, I've got a couple that are on the radar, but they're not triggering, okay? So no new positions are being added, and that's because of the market. We've, we've had quite a few stocks recently on the radar, and none have triggered. So they, they come into the portfolio as a possible short or long, whatever the case may be, and then they go away because they don't trigger after so many days, and we keep doing that. So that's, again, it's, it's the ebb and flow. What's the optimal number of positions? I don't know. Uh, maybe nine losing positions and one position that not only makes up for all nine, but makes up for the last 20 positions uh, taken. You know, it's, it, it, there's no set amount. Now, if things are going really well, you might have seven or eight positions on. If things aren't going too well, like now, we got one position on. Okay, so that's a roundabout way of saying that it it uh, it varies depending on the market conditions. Okay, hi Dave. Related to my earlier question about the ideal number of positions in trend following portfolio, if a trader has been out of the market for a while and then begins to enter, should this be done quickly or over time, say a few weeks? Okay, stop right there. You you take things on a setup by setup basis, so you don't jump in and say, I'm trend following, let me put on 10 positions today, okay? And that's why it takes time to develop a portfolio of positions. Uh, the, the caveat to that is the short side, it can be tough because you, you'll get a bunch of triggers all at once. But as a general statement, it, it takes time to put on positions, so... When I'm on that fifth position, looking to the sixth, those five positions have been on for probably a few weeks. It'd probably take me two or three weeks to, to get into five positions if conditions are, are, are doing well, are going well. So in that time, I have become a trend follower, and those positions better be working several weeks in before I consider putting on even more positions, okay? So, no, you don't jump in. You scale into the market, and you scale in simply. You don't do it scientifically. You do it simply by taking set, set, taking things on a setup-by-setup setup basis. You see a setup you really like, put it on your radar. If it triggers, then take it. If it doesn't trigger, then leave it on the radar for a few days. And if it still doesn't trigger, you might want to take it off. And each day you're looking at new setups or new potential setups. And lately there's not a whole lot to do, so you're not looking at taking a whole lot of new action. Okay? Now, to if you, if you recommend over time, might the small portfolio size expose you to a series of losses through a major drawdown and through a loss of confidence in the methodology? Again, thanks for your comments on these issues. Okay, so James is saying you got a small account, and then you start, you start to trade, and things get choppy on you. Would this psychologically... Inf um, affect you. Absolutely. Absolutely. It would make you think, well, why am I wasting my time doing this? My whole point is that, and this is as I'm getting older and older, I'm, I'm learning to broaden my horizons and look a little further out and look past the choppiness, etc. By the way, if the, my, I'll, I'll tell you the clients I like, and I'll tell you the best clients, and I'll tell you what makes the best, not only clients, but what makes the best traders. Okay, I would bet that the guy that comes in right here and trades through this crap, okay, and just grinds it out, and then the market begins to trend, 
I would much rather bet on him than the guy who is gung-ho and doesn't know what hits him. As Joe Corona says, he's a trader who's traveled the world. I think he's settled down a little bit in more recent times. I think he's in Austin and Chicago uh, commuting in between. Um, but he used to travel the world looking for volatility, which sounds like a fun thing to do. But I think as he, as he started hitting his 50s, he decided traveling wasn't uh, as much fun as it used to be. Anyway, long story endless, um, he said that when he was in India, he said, I like the new guys to have their ass handed to them right away. And it's like then, only then they learn to expect to uh, control risk. Uh, the guy who comes in and just prints money, don't confuse the brains uh, with the bull market. Don't confuse, don't confuse brains with the bull market, as I often say. So I'd much rather bet on a guy who starts with less than ideal times. So if you are going to trade, you have to see it as a long-term venture. It's not something you're going to dabble in. It's not going to be a hobby. It's going to be something that is going to be a long-term venture, and you're going to put the time in to do it right. Okay. Uh, again, one day at a time, let the market come to you. I can't preach that enough right now. Um, it, it sure looks like this thing is going to is head lower, but they're not going to make it easier on us. It's not going to be a route. And we're going to look at a few things here in just one second. Once again, the great offense, playing a good offense is very, very, very important. So I know it's cliche, but trade the best and leave the rest, okay? I've been a pretty cleansed trader recently. Well, good. That's okay. You know what? Get your um, – get a few um, – battle scars okay and that's uh what, what doesn't destroy you makes you stronger okay all right related to my earlier questions okay all right we answered that one i think hi dave if you discover no okay we got that one so if it looks easy to trade then it probably is um i'm not sure where you're going with that but I will tell you this, when you find yourself struggling, it's, it's, it's when you probably need to back off a little bit. Uh, it's amazing to me how easy it is when things are working. It's all, um, you go in, you do your scans, you get excited because you can't decide which setups to choose. Then you look at them, spend about 20 minutes or however long trying to decide between setups where when you're just looking at your charts for hours and hours and hours and you can't find a setup to save your life, that's when you can't you, you gotta stop pressing, you gotta stop trying, you gotta let it go. Okay. So it it it's amazingly easy when everything's working and then it's really tough when it's not. But when you recognize that it's getting tough, then you just become more and more and more selective and you end up sitting on your hands. Okay. We can't afford to go anywhere until we get the next trend. All right, Phil. <laughs> good. Hang around. Uh, survival first and foremost. Good times always come. Absolutely. He who, run, who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. But, again, all these things I've said, some are cliche, but it's true. The reason that trend following works is because sometimes it don't. And then the only way you're going to ever make any money is to capture a trend. So my point is let's be a trend follower all the time. Maybe back off a little bit and let the market come to us, wait for our pitch or whatever analogy you want to use uh, when things are less than ideal. And like the Eddie Z wrote, uh, one of the traders in his book wrote, uh, the market is not going out of business. Okay. With the eternal so poor, does it make sense to focus one's analysis on the short or contra side to be more prepared when the trend returns? Well, uh, it's okay to look. I wouldn't call it the contra side. I mean, although the, the S&P, of course, is, is just off of all-time highs in here, but there are some stocks that have begun to roll over. There are quite a few stocks that are in bona fide downtrend, so I think that you should consider putting on some shorts. But it's been really tough on the short side lately. We had two, like I said, one work with discretion, one didn't. Overall, it's probably a scratch or a little worse than a scratch. But I think it was worth a shot because everything appeared to be rolling over, and then it got choppy or became choppier. But I think, yeah, now it's okay to keep an eye out for some shorts 
Um, you don't want to label yourself a bull or a bear too much. But yeah, internals are falling apart. And um, we'll take a look at that in one second. What do you do with long stock that is trading really well, but coming into earnings the next day? Nothing. I, re I realize you don't care about news, but we just sit to earnings. I would sell prior if weak. What about strength if it seems everything is getting hit? No. No, you can't. You, you can't. You got to stop thinking. You got to stop thinking so much, okay? Uh, yeah, you got to get whacked sooner or later. But so what? It comes to the territory, okay? Um, you want to be a boxer, you're going to get punched in the face, <laughs> right? So just deal with it. And your damage control can often mitigate your losses. But don't try to second guess things just because earnings or around the block or whatever. And, and, and again, you have to take a longer term approach and more often than not, the, the stock will react um, in an inverse direction to the perceived news, okay? I've left this slide in for several weeks now, several months now, but I think it's cool. It's like, a, Again, plan your trade and trade your plan. Most people don't do that, but if you learn how to do that, your life becomes much, much easier. And I think I could sum it up in just one statement. Obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. You shouldn't be worried about what possible upcoming news events are coming into the stock or what may or may not happen. That's what stops are for. That's where the pressure's off. You get stopped out and you get stopped out. Okay. A couple of announcements and we'll hop into the charts. Um, as I often preach, trade the best and leave the rest. That was the goal of the stock selection webinar. My concern going into the webinar was that conditions weren't that great. It turns out they actually were. We had a tremendous amount of uh, IPOs, some great looking stocks, and then the performance. Uh, from those stocks I picked on that one day did really well. Um, thank goodness it doesn't it's not always that way, but when it's not, you just don't get that many stocks. And uh, I put every stock that we picked on the 14th last uh, um, last December in here. Anyway, uh, if you want the stock selection webinar, uh, the new uh, offer is you get one year of my service for free. So it's like getting um, it's like getting a year of the service for free, <laughs> so, which is um, half the price if both uh, combined together. Um, what else? I have uh, 2013. If you want, if you like these uh, weekend charts, uh, usually what I'll do is I'll do a volume one and two. And since volume one of 2014 is going to be out soon, um, I went ahead and discounted 2013 the entire year, uh, which would it's half the price of, of purchase separate, separately. Um, I thought I had more flash drives than I do. I only have a few left, so if you want that, uh, I'm on the cusp of running out. But if you want that, uh, see my website or my, my newsletter for more on that. And I want to thank you guys. Um, if you like these shows, there's a lot of good stuff in these shows. You guys draw me out really well, not from an egotistical standpoint, but just from a – it's great, the questions you ask and the things that you get me to talk about and on. I think that that um, – Makes them worthwhile. Anyway, first two books are still relevant. See my website for that. And I do have a trading service, which we talk about almost every week in here. All right, let's get into the overall markets. Um, if you want to uh, if you want to um, start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so at this time. Just ask about stocks on one uh, line at a time. Are you f familiar with trend follower John Henry? I've heard of him. Um, What's the question? Okay. All right, then. Let's get into the um, – I've read all the Market Wizard books. I'm sure these guys have gotten uh, mentioned at some point. All right, let's take a look at the uh, overall market. And then I want to take a look at a few sectors in here, and there's some things I think will come out. Are kind of interesting. First of all, let's take a look at the P's. Okay, um, I like to look at the micro and then work my way out to the macro. So let's just erase everything. 
real quick. Uh, first of all, in the micro, we're up today. And if you draw a horizontal line, look at that. We're within spitting distance of all-time highs. How far, you might ask? Well, if the market can get up another 0.11%, then we would be at new highs. That looks like all is great in the world. Unfortunately, all is not great in the world. We'll get to that. But it's certainly a positive development. This is a game of clues. We put together the pieces of the puzzle and try to figure it all out. What's concerning is we went up today. We were up yesterday. We were down the day before. We were up the day before. We were down. And then a couple days before that, we were up. And then if you let me just go back in history. Let's just go back 10, 11 days. Down, up, down, up 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 down down up down up okay so you you see the you see the picture beginning to unfold i wonder if a two-day chart would show that more cleanly uh, let's see down up down up yeah you, you, you've got a short-term cycle where it's just vacillating in here um some people call these railroad tracks because the bars kind of the up and down bars look like railroad tracks uh, it's just sideways movement. So I wouldn't get too excited about this market until it could actually break out to new highs and stay there. Okay. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ, we'll come back to the P's in a minute too. NASDAQ's having a decent day today, but as you can see, it's been pretty choppy as of late. And also the downtrend remains intact there. Um, I don't always draw trend lines. I'm not a huge fan of drawing them, connecting the highs and the lows. But if you did that, okay, quite simply, nothing wrong with doing that. I have other ways of doing it. But if you quite simply did that, you could see that the market is obviously in a downtrend. If you just look at things on a net net basis, 43, 50, 4,000, okay, it's a 350 point drop round numbers, maybe 400. Um, it's going down. One thing I like to do when I'm drawing trend lines is I like to connect the high from the big move down to the low and then kind of do that throughout. And then you can see that the market began to drop off and then it's kind of like it's chopped around, connecting the highs and lows. That's one thing I like to do. And as you know, I often like to draw lines through the bars like I did earlier when I showed the S&Ps when it was in that very persistent trend. Uh, mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. regression. But you can see the NASDAQ's getting kind of choppy in here. Um, as I say quite often, when in doubt, take the chart out. And you can see it looks like a downtrend, but then some choppiness in between. Now, let's take a look at the Russell. Rusty's looking a little bit more cleanly as far as a downtrend is concerned. And when you sort of connect your lines there, you get a little bit different picture. In fact, let's clean the chart up a little bit. And again, you know, pick a high, pick a low for your legs. Okay. And then now you're kind of like down here to this low. And if you take the chart out on that, it looks like a pretty serious downtrend. And, and you wouldn't know how choppy it's actually been. Okay. Like in the NASDAQ, NASDAQ is unchanged month over month, believe it or not. And that's a pretty big. Uh, that's four weeks of trading and no progress one way or the other. So very bumpy ride on the short side. Somebody was asking me about should we short? The answer is yes. The only problem is pick your spots carefully, wait for entries, honor your stops, blah, 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 because it's been a choppy market, okay? And be expect a, quite a bit of uh, whipsaw. Now, one thing that I've been doing a lot of lately is looking at these areas that are holding up the P's. And lately, today notwithstanding, um, you have energies, you have utilities, you have foods. There's the foods right there, banging on new highs. Where's utilities? They're in here somewhere. I can find them. There they are. Okay. At or near new highs. My big concern is what's going to happen when these issues correct. And today it looks like, so far, market's doing pretty good and it looks like some of these issues are a little soft in here so it's not having a material impact on the market the 
thing you have to do is, like I say, every day, look at a lot of stocks to get a feel for things. Look at a lot of sectors to get a feel for things, too. And sometimes dig within, and I've done a lot of research lately on the S&Ps to show that the breadth within the S&P 500 has been very narrow. In other words, there's only a few select areas, namely these defensive issues that are holding up the whole market. Now, day like today, things improving. Let's see if we can make it to new highs. Let's see what happens. But again, my main concern is since these defensive issues have been on such a run, what's going to happen when they correct? Uh, chemicals are a new area that's kind of popping out in here. So if enough new sectors come along and start making new highs or having major reversals, then we may have dodged a bullet with this bad breath and bad internals uh, that I've been seeing. Um, as I preach quite often, you got to be careful not to chase your own tail when you're at or near new highs like we are. So even while I'm talking, as, as uh, concerned as I've been about the market, I'm kind of thinking, oh, heck, uh, the, um, oh, heck this S&P is almost at brand new highs. I'm not going to argue with that. So you got to be careful because right around the top of the trading range, it's going to look a little bullish and uh, towards the bottom of the range, or if it stalls towards the top of the range, however you want to look at it, then it becomes a uh, bearish looking really quick. For instance, uh, you know, you bounce off the range like right here. Looks like the end of the world. But then all of a sudden you're back towards the top of the range. Oh, all is clear in the world. By the way, a lot of people don't want to wait around for that breakout. So you're probably seeing people anticipating that breakout and getting in now. And the problem with that is, is if the market does begin to sell off, those Johnny come lately are usually the, the um, fast money and very fickle traders, and they're the first out. But anyway, energy's uh, doing okay, chemicals doing okay, and not much else. And then when you look at some areas like the banks, you can say, well, they're kind of going sideways in here. But when you dig deeper into like the regionals, the trends, if you draw through the bars, like a linear regression, the trends there are obviously down, as you can see. And on some of them, I've drawn the arrow in. Um, anything technology related has been pretty ugly in here, although internet's a little choppy. It was hitting new lows just yesterday, a little bit of a bounce today, obviously. If you take a look at something like hardware, which is kind of hanging in there, but when you dig a little deeper within the sector, you'll see that there's not a whole lot of stocks that are trending within the sector. And if, I bet if you took Apple out, things will look um, much, much, much uglier, okay? Okay. Um, I really don't think there's a whole lot more to cover the sectors. Most sectors remain in downtrends, but it's been a bumpy ride. For instance, biotech just had a nice little thrust down, pull back, and then it looked like it was off to the races, but then what happened? It's going sideways in here, okay? So a lot of tech has looked like that lately. So it's been tough to short and stay short, but it sure looks like the market still wants to go down, okay? BIS, Contra Biotech. Well, it's no longer set up. One thing you have to be careful about, now that we're, on, we're, on, uh, we're officially on um, individual issues, one thing you have to be careful about, and I've, t I've talked with quite a few of you guys about this before, inverse shares track things on a day-by-day -day basis, and that exacerbates the tracking error. So unless you get a one-sided market, like a 2008 or late 2007, early 2008, or even most of 2008, where the market is pretty much one-sided. These inverse ETFs don't work that great. They're great on paper, but when you try to put them in a the portfolio, there's a natural decay that goes to them. Okay. Now, if you in by natural decay, they they just tend to go down. Okay. Pick a pick an inverted. Now I know biotech had a good run, but if you could pick pretty much any inverse ETF, they just tend to go down, and then they split them, and then they go down again, and they split them. Um, you don't necessarily want to bottom fish in them because they'll just reverse split them, okay? But it did bottom out. It was looking pretty good in here, but now it's kind of meandering uh, back and forth. So I would leave it alone as a new position. If you're already long, stay long. But remember, in anything inverse like this, there's going to be a natural decay working against you. So you need to uh, think about, this is one case where I'm not a big fan 
of um, of letting the market take you out because it's almost like you have to get out on a time stop basis because there is a natural decay that you're dealing with. Okay, Don's here, <laughs> and guess what he wants to know about? He even said it for me. No, uh, yeah, it's just all over the place. It went up, it went down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then it also has a tremendous amount of overhead resistance or supply, if you prefer to call it that. So um, I'm going to have to say no to that, Don. Why is that a shocker? I had a picture of um, Don and uh, last week's thing. Nobody, uh, nobody thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. That's Nicholas Feinstein. Okay, V V U S. You can maybe say V V U S. No. Yeah, are you bottom fishing? Um, because it looks like it's headed lower longer term. Shorter term, it's kind of bottoming out in here, but it has a lot of overhead supply. So that stock would have to rally maybe above six bucks and change, and then you got a little more overhead supply here. So it looks like it's making a big picture cup and handle, but this is just the left side of the cup here. The completion of this cup could be a very long time, so there's no reason to rush in and bottom fish on something like that. James wants to know about URI. URI. Um, no, it's flat. Okay. Uh, draw your lines, and you can see that it's going mostly sideways as of late. Strong day, the semiconductor, does that mean much to you? Eh, it, it, it doesn't hurt anything, okay? But it, it once again, this is kind of like when you dig within, okay? It seems to have a decent day in here. That's good, but they're still pretty much sideways, and then when you dig within them, the equipment makers, you can see, look like they've kind of rolled over in here. So it's still a case of, yeah, there's improvement, but there's still a lot of ugliness um, underneath. UNG, UNG. Um, this is natural gas, uh, or as a friend of mine's wife says, gas with a Z. Uh, two Zs, I guess. Gas. Um, no, it's gone sideways in here. It's nothing to do with that. Okay. Uh, Carl, I like that one, but it's on it's on my list for today uh, for my people, so I can't talk about it. But, uh, yeah, high five on that one. Good job. They, not the. Uh, oh, okay, and the uh, Yeah, good job. High, fi high five. Give you a high five. As a short, though. As a short, right? THRM. See, that's the thing Carl's bringing up is that I guess you see the same thing I'm seeing. I'm seeing... A cell setup, yeah, okay, going short, absolutely. Uh, I'm seeing a cell setup in a food, and the foods have been going straight up. Uh, I'm seeing some debacle de jours happen within the market, and that in and of itself is concerning. But when you start to see, like, some energies or foods begin to break down, you know, I don't know. You have to ask yourself, is that the beginning? Is that a canary in a coal mine? And you got to look for clues, and you got to keep looking for these things, and, uh one day at a time. Obviously, once you're in positions, then your stops control your portfolio. But getting into new positions, again, you want to obsess before going in. And before you go to buy the energy company or that food company, because that's the only game in town, it's the only stocks that are going up, then you need to maybe dig a little bit within the, in those sectors to see what's really going on. And if you're seeing some areas beginning to deteriorate, then you need to really think twice about buying into that area. I hate playing the only game in town. Give me a market where everything's going up, and I can pick a stock that I like the best, and if I'm not exactly right, the rising tide's going to lift my boat. Whereas now it's like you pick a stock in energies or utilities or foods, and then you hope that trend continues, uh, and it's not backed by a trend in the overall market. Okay, ROSG, that's going to be a energy company. Speaking of energy, ROSG. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking of um, 
Who am I thinking of? I'm thinking of Rose something. Who am I thinking of? Rose. Let's see if I can find it. I'm losing my mind. Maybe I was thinking of Rosetta Resources. Oh, R O S G R O S E. This is what I was thinking of, which is uh, oil and gas. What were you asking about? Having a brain fart here. We'll take a look at both of them. Uh, R O S E is a little too sideways. And here's the deal. When you take a look at energies overall, what do they look like? They look like that. Okay, and in fact, I need to redraw my arrow because it's still looking pretty good in here. So if the overall sector looks like that, then you don't want to go after something like Rose that's going sideways. Now, I don't know if you were asking about ROSG. We could talk about that one too. Uh, this is a biotech. It looks like it's headed lower. Uh, but it's already imploded, and it's also less than 5 bucks a share. Kind of hard to short at this juncture, so leave that alone. Okay, JCP, really? No. I make fun of this stock, but hang on. JJCP. Um, no, it's just kind of chopping around down here at low levels. Uh, and then it's going to have bad memories along the way. Look how thick it is. It's super duper thick stock. So I think you can find something better. TESO. Um, Zhao. Zhaoli. Zhaoi. Zhao. I know I'm butchering your name. My apologies. TESO. Um, no, what I don't like about this one is it rallied up. And then it's it it just kind of stalled out a little bit towards its prior highs in here. Again, it comes back to with energy overall looking like this, you want to avoid stocks that look like up, down, up, okay, kind of all over the place. Maybe if it clears the prior highs decisively, maybe on a pullback, but for now, I would leave that one alone. THRM, THRM. Uh, not bad. Um, a little extended longer term. It's up about 400% in the last year or so. Right now, when I'm asking myself, when I see a stock like this, it's up 400%. I'm saying, self, stock has ran 400%. How much longer can it go? Especially since the market is at such high levels, the S&P at least. Um, so I would probably pass based on that. But... As a good little trend follower, I certainly can't beat you up. Maybe a slightly deeper correction would be uh, in order here, but it, it looks okay. But I would pass based on uh, the fact that it's had a good run and market conditions. IWM has lower lows. NASDAQ has two higher lows, IWM. I wouldn't get too excited about uh, the the minutia of that. I hear what you're saying. Okay, this is a low. This is a low. Lower lows, and the Nasdaq has higher lows, higher low, and a higher low. Um, they're both choppy and they're both still in downtrends. But I hear you. That's but you can't trade off of that. Okay. But yeah, pay you're paying attention. That's a good thing. Frenchie wants to know about ISR. ISR. Uh, no, because. All of your gains were made over like two days in here, and now it's been kind of wide and loose, okay? I call it a bottle rocket. Sometimes they take off, and then they die out and come right back in. So it's kind of dangerous to trade. Wynn says, your strategy waiting for the entry did keep me away from a lot of troubles. A great strategy, thanks. Yeah, it's not my strategy. I, I didn't develop entries, uh, but I can tell you this. Waiting for that entry in a lot of cases will keep you out of a lot, a lot of trouble. Especially in choppy markets and especially if you're willing to make those entries a little bit more liberal. Here's one, for instance. This WAB looked like it was in a lot of trouble. We had a liberal entry on here, probably around 72 or something. And it never triggered. And now, after the setup, let's see, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 
It's now going three weeks sideways, so it's certainly no longer set up. But hey, we didn't uh, didn't make any money. We didn't lose any money though. Yeah, Scott, that one's on my momentum list. But um, let me sh let's pull it up. But has it gone too far? But yeah, I don't know. Um, the fact that it's already gone up from way down here all the way to there, um, and and it could keep going. And that's why I put it in my momentum list. But as far as trading, and if you're an individual trading a few stocks, you're going to get whacked on some of these go-go stocks when they do correct. But if you're putting them to a big box of uh, portfolio with, a, with, in my case, 99 other stocks where I'm not actually trading those particular stocks, but it's just a, a way of tracking momentum stocks, then there's no problem with that, putting it into that list. Um, but yeah, I would leave it alone as an individual trade. Ken says, Amazon, how far down before ridiculous? I don't know. How do you define ridiculous? Um, there's nothing ridiculous about that. It's going down. Okay. It's going to have some support back here along the way. Okay. You can't confuse the issue with facts. You can't say, well, they're the largest retailer in the world. They're making money. They're blah, blah, blah. Well, they're also going down. Okay, what is a fundamental suggests what a market ought to be doing and technicals of what the market actually is doing. And then what was Greg's quote? Uh, greatest fun fundamentals are bound by what the technicals will allow. So if it's got good fundamentals, then so what? Market doesn't like it. It's headed lower. WM for Mr. Steve. WM. Uh, not bad. Let's back the chart out. Um, little on the low side on the historical volatility scale. And I prefer stocks that have cleared their prior peak. So I would pass based on that. But I hear what you're saying. It looked like a broke out pullback trying to make a new leg higher. Swing trade possibly, but I like to position myself for longer term trades. TSO is a short for Mr. Don. Yeah, so no, it's short. No, <laughs> you know, I don't think Don has read my book. I'm convinced. Um, but no, that's not a short. Now it hasn't taken on its prior highs, but that in and of itself doesn't mean anything. I mean, shorter term looks okay. It's ran up and pulled back. But yeah, leave that alone. SGY, watch for potential knockouts. Entry setting up for Mr. Joe. S G Y House Things. You're in San Fran, Joe. Yeah, you got a gap down here. So um Yeah, I wouldn't see it as a TKO to the upside because you got this gap here. You also have sort of an island reversal. Ooh, whatever that is, right? Uh four birds crap it on a, crap it on an island. You got one, two, three, four. You got the five birds on an island pattern there on a deserted island. <laughs> no, I would leave that alone. I wouldn't play it as a long. If anything, it could be in trouble. And this is this is a great example of, hey, that's an energy stock, which is beginning to break down. So that's, that's not a good thing. BDN is a long. BDN. BDN. Um... Yeah, Carl. I can't. Uh, I can't talk about that one. You could. You could ask about. You could ask about any stocks you want. But I. That's one that. Uh, like I said earlier, it's on my list. Um. Well, it's making new highs. This stock would have to continue to make new highs. It's normally wide and loose, so it's down. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. So it would have to trend for a while. Prove, prove to me that it can trend uh, before looking to um, get long. CBRR. That's going to be trending, but it's not set up. And I know this because it um, was um, hitting my momentum list over the last few days. Um, well, I didn't, I wasn't aware of today's action, but yeah, it has gapped down. I would leave it alone unless it could fill the gap and then actually trade higher before I would look to even trade it. Trade higher and then maybe the next pullback. 
But when I see a gap down, I think a stock might be broken. San Jose. Okay. New time to buy. New old time to buy. Any WL? I don't know. Let's see. Now, keep in mind, there's not a whole lot. No, no. <laughs> no, you don't want to catch a falling knife. And, you know, a stupid stock like this, they'll just they'll just reverse split it. No, it's not time to buy. I mean, if you do that they would never go out of business, then by all means you can go for it. But you don't know that. And what's the problem? Let's see. They probably have some regulatory requirements. I mean, at one point in time, that was a $70,000 stock from where you are now, okay? And that's because they just, when it, when it turns into a piece of crap like this, they reverse split it, and then they the process begins all over again. Stay away from that. Avoid that like the plague. H-I-M-X. Um, it's in a downtrend. But it's not set up. So, yeah, it's in a downtrend. AER? Er? Er? Well, it's had a pretty good run. Uh, maybe on a pullback, because you do have a base breakout. First pullback on a base breakout. But, eh, just having a hard time getting excited about it. Let me back the chart way out. Yeah, it's had a pretty good run. It might be priced for perfection. Okay. GWPH. Uh, I don't like the way it's stalling at uh, below its prior highs in here. Okay. Um, if anything, it looks like a stock that's still in trouble. Long RDNT, very strong stock, seem to find support. Seems to find support of the 10-day SMA, earnings tomorrow a.m. Okay. Now, don't come crying to me tomorrow and go, oh, you told me to stay long. I didn't tell you to do anything except follow your plan, whatever your real plan was, whatever your plan was. Yeah, I mean, it's had a pretty good run. Um, I mean, here's the deal. I don't know where you got in, but if you got in around 250 or so, then you should have taken partial profits by now, and you should have a trailing stop. So if the earnings are adverse tomorrow, uh, worst case, hopefully worst case, is you can stop out of the profit on that one, okay? HP for Steve, probably not going to like it. Uh, no, it's high-looking pain. I always get this in the uh, Hewitt-Packard, confused. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. Uh, my only problem is, it kind of lost momentum here. It took off, and then it came back in, and then it went sideways again. So uh, take that back when it looks okay. It would actually have to make brand new highs and set up again for me to get excited about that. DXM, David X-Ray, Michael. Uh, no, it sold off, and then it came all the way back. So it has no structure to it. It's all over the place. Leave that alone for now. HK long, HK, are you already long? See, it really didn't do enough of a knockout move for me to get excited, but hey, so far it's worked in here. Um, maybe put this on your momentum list and maybe wait for the next pullback because it is breaking out in here, but I wouldn't buy it just because it's broken out, okay? RDNT. ISR. No, it, it it like I said earlier, it shot higher last week or whatever we talked about this. So it just shot up and then now it just kind of meandered sideways. Again, those bottle rockets when they go straight up and make hundred percent overnight or two hundred percent overnight, then they just kinda of tend to chop around. Or worse, they come all the way back in. W R E S as a long. No. <laughs> Did I just do Nicholas? No. No, it's sideways. Draw your arrows. Okay. And as you can see, it's been mostly sideways. 
H-E-S. We talk about that one? That's Hess. Yeah, maybe on a little more pullback. It's certainly in a longer-term uptrend. It looks okay. My problem with a lot of these defensive-related issues is, look at the HV. It's 14. It's pretty low. So it's kind of hard for me to get excited about that. How about Dish? Uh, no, uh, because you got a, a V-shaped recovery at high levels. So it's just no structure there. See, I, I wouldn't buy it, and I wouldn't short it. P&M for John. Um, I wouldn't have bought this, although it did catch my eye when it broke out a couple of days ago, because you got all this overhead supply back here. But so far, it's, it's blown through it. I don't know. I would have to make new highs with vigor and then pull back for me to get excited about it. SU. Uh, yeah, that's not bad. It's trending, though, so you got to wait for a setup. It does have some bad memories or some um, higher levels many years ago. So eh, it's far enough back to not get too excited about it. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback, but it's definitely trending. SGY for potential knockout entry. Yeah, we talked about that one. P&M for John. Uh, yeah, we just talked about that one. Any more? Well, while we're, while we're at an impasse, oh, there comes another one. There comes quite a few. Um, well, let me just take a second here. I want to thank everybody for coming and taking the time and busy schedule. We'll get a few more in, and then we'll wrap it up. OGP. I am humbled by your presence. Yeah, you've got a couple of big updates here, but in general, it's a choppy stock, so I don't see any reason why you'd want to... Um, rush out and buy this particular stock at this juncture. Okay. Okay, anything else? Going once. Going twice. AUMN. <laughs> AUMN. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, this is um, a lot of golds look like they're going to go down and challenge their own lows. Let them do that first. Let them go back to their old lows. See if they bounce off those old lows and then see if they set up. If they do all of the above, then by all means, it might be worth a shot. But I wouldn't try to catch them on the way down, okay? All right, ODP, OD, ODP. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, yeah, it's just a big gap. Uh, and there's really no structure to it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap things up. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here again. I'm humbled by your presence. Um, I have a blast doing these things. I don't know if you could tell, but um, I certainly do enjoy them. So thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Uh, anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLander.com. I'll either answer you directly or it will become fodder for next week's show. If we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic week uh, weekend, and we'll uh, talk again next Thursday. If that's Thank you so much.